So I concluded that if I was going to do this, um, I was going to have to withdraw from the program that I was in. And I had to go to the Dean of the College of Engineering and it was a very awkward and difficult and long and drawn out uh, talk. And I, I don't remember now if I told him about this vision or not, but suffice it to say, he did not want to sign the release paper. And right. I think we went at it for about three or four hours. Wow. And he finally relented and signed it. And he said, you'll live to regret this. And right, most people don't leave Princeton. It's hard enough to well, get I didn't in. leave Princeton. Now, to be clear, I was still at Princeton University. Oh, okay. I simply transferred from the College of Engineering to the College of Arts and Letters. Got it. Where I could study a subject more like what all of these, uh, you know, these other um, seminaries and whatnot that I'd written to had said in their catalogs, you need to have this kind of a background to get admitted to our school. Right. And so, the, and those were all graduate level programs. So the, the objective now was to get my bachelor's at Princeton still, just not in engineering. And then to transition from that to a, a master's level program in, you know, theology or divinity. But how and, ironic that the God, God has used you so mightily in the gifts of the spirit and Princeton is where B.B. Warfield wrote the doctrine of cessationism. <laughs> like how true. ironic is that? Yeah. And, you know, there's a whole there's a whole backstory in that, too, which most people don't really know. But Princeton University, where I was, was founded in 1746. Um, and its first president was none other than Jonathan Edwards, the right. Jonathan Edwards, that Jonathan Edwards. Right. And um, anyway, so from 1746 forward, Princeton was a center of what they called uh, new light education and new light the, the simplest and easiest analog today would be to say these were born again preachers who had had a new birth experience and they just were using the language of the new light in those ears. So anyway, if you were a new light person, you were going to Princeton so that you could be trained in what today we might say revivalism. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, eventually the fires started to go out. And so in 1812, the same year that the war of 1812 occurred, uh, Princeton Theological Seminary started across the street from Princeton University because it was believed that the university had become too liberal and was no longer really preaching the new light. And so they started this seminary up, and for a while it persisted in that, but eventually it kind of cooled off. And in 1920, so about 90-ish, well, nearly 90 years after the founding of the seminary, there was a breakaway from the seminary now and these two, they are both in Princeton. So Princeton University, Princeton Seminary, they both bear the name of Princeton, but they are legally distinct entities. They are, they are not related to each other in any way. They just happen to sit across the street from each other. Um, but anyway, um, Jay Gresham Machen and a group of conservative scholars out of Princeton Seminary, uh, they left and they went to Philadelphia and they started Westminster Seminary, which is still there to this day, and it's it's a uh, hundred years ago this year that Westminster Seminary started. Mm -hmm. So then, how did you get from there to uh, Pasadena and going to school at Fuller Theological? Um, well, so I graduated from Princeton University, and um, even though I'd had this vision, I, I like I said, I, I did not I did not readily acquiesce to this even though there was no ambiguity about what it was. And I'm not really proud of it, but I, I just mention it because, again, there's often people will say, well, if God would just speak to me, then I would know and I would do it. Well, when you have your own ideas about what your future should be, sometimes you struggle with that. And ultimately, the Lord wins those arguments, but, but <laughs> sometimes it takes a while to get you there. So yeah. I went off to Wall Street, and I was uh, working on Wall Street and my, my physical address was literally on the street with the name Wall Street, right? I mean, you know where it is, Pete, because you work in the city. But anyway, so I was, uh, I was working there, and um, I ultimately uh, took a you know, short vacation and went back to California where I live or where I was from. And uh, I visited John Wimber's church, and I, I just said, I, I mean, I, I just have to be here. This is, if this is all right and going on, and I had seen stuff happen, including the healing of my own mother very dramatically. I just said, I, 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 there's nothing else I can do. I'm, I mean, I'm just kind of, what today year? we would say I'm wrecked or I'm ruined. 
What year was that? Um, 80, late, well, I, I went back and visited in uh, the end of 82, and then I returned back again in 83, and that was the end of it. And was the class still going on, the MC510 at that time? Yeah, it was. I took the, I took the MC510 class that John Wimber was teaching at Fuller Seminary. Um, he was the uh, adjunct professor, Peter Wagner. C. Peter Wagner was the faculty member of record. Um, and once I'd taken the class, I actually became John Wimber's TA. And I, you know, sat in all the lectures, graded papers, interacted with students. And from time to time, it doesn't happen very much because it's getting to be old history, really old history. But mm -hmm. from time to time, I will have people that I meet on the road or that are in my uh, private Facebook group or whatever, they will come to me and they'll say, I, I remember you, you were a TA in the MC510 class when I took it. And I'm like, yeah, that's right. Because so Doris there, Wagner- There's still a few of those people around. Doris Wagner tells me she would have to take attendance on the way in because people were trying to sneak in the class who hadn't paid for the credits because they wanted to see the miracles that were happening. And that's right. when do you hear about that? Nobody's usually trying to sneak into a class. They're trying to usually cut class. But uh, exactly I guess right. it was, the thing was, Peter knew the theology, but John wanted to do, he wanted to demonstrate what was going on, not just talk about it. That's correct. Although John had quite a few lectures that he had prepared. They weren't Pete's lectures, they were John's. Right. And, you know, they dealt with things like worldview and why we have difficulty seeing these things normally and how worldview affects the way we do theology. So for example, I mean, back to what you were saying with Warfield, you know, why he could write a book called Counterfeit Miracles. What, what was the worldview? What was the lens through which he viewed reality that kept him from getting there? And, you know, John had a number of whatever exhibits and displays that he would use in showing people how worldview works. But he didn't just talk about worldview. He talked about um, he would talk about things like the development of doctrine and how the healing gifts in particular, but, but more broadly, supernaturalism died out in the, in the church, uh, particularly in the West, sort of persisted in the Eastern Rite churches uh, for far longer. But even there, it became more muted. So he, he talked about the history of all of that. Um, and then, of course, came cl clinic time, as we called it. And the whole point was to demonstrate the very things we'd been talking about. And so, you know, right there in the room, people would get various kinds of healings or deliverance or whatever and these it was. Were, these were students getting a PhD, many of which had been out on the mission field and had never heard that a Christian could need deliverance. That's am, right. Am I right? So That's correct. The, talk about shifting your worldview and a paradigm shift on the oh, fly. Yeah. They're watching their co-students making noises that they never would have thought, like something from the Exorcist movie uh, in their minds. And yet, you know, the school isn't even teaching that this should be happening today. So that created another whole problem, right? Well, that's right, because all of this was being done, as I said, under the auspices of C. Peter Wagner. And he was a professor in the, what, was one, what was at that time called the School of World Mission, or SWIM, S-W-M, School of World Mission. And... Um, there were some other people there. Uh, Chuck Kraft was part of that faculty. Uh, Paul Pearson was the dean of the mission school. Uh, Dudley Woodbury. Anyway, all of these people in one way or another were, I would say, open to or pursuing supernatural style ministry. But John Wimber was by far the, the most adept of the practitioners. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, the MC510 class got underway and that was just its course designator. It was a course on church growth, M for mission, C for church growth, 510 because it was a graduate level course. Um, and, you know, so we met once a week in the evenings and uh, John would lecture and then we'd do clinic and sometimes we'd get out of there pretty late. But, you know, the, the school, Fuller, had two other schools within it. So the School of World Mission was one of its three major silos, but the other two were the School of Theology, which taught kind of conventional theological subjects. And then there was a School of Psychology for those that were training in, say, marriage and family therapy or clinical psych or things like that. And um, I think the real, uh, the real animus came from the School of Theology, SOT as they called it. Right. But 
but there was also pushback from the School of Psychology or the SOP. Right. And I think that these two sort of linked arms and they exerted their combined will and effectively got the 510 class, MC 510 class, shut down and driven from campus. And it wasn't real long after that. It wasn't immediate, but maybe it was three years or four years later, he did, just said, you know, I'd, I've had enough. And he left and started the Wagner uh, right. stuff that he was doing in Colorado. But it's so ironic how circular it is, because you read the New Testament, the Pharisees couldn't understand what Jesus was doing. Instead of just accepting the miracles and realizing they had to shift their worldview, they want to kill him. You know, and here's yeah. the school of theology. It's happening right in their midst. And the only thing they can do is blame it on the devil. Meanwhile, people are getting healed. And they, can't, they have to ignore it and shut it down. And... Boy, if that's not something we're going to be accountable for when we get to the, to the throne, and, and here he's like, I'm demonstrating it right in your midst, and you still can't accept it, and you have to shut it down. It's a real religious it, mindset. It was really amazing because, I mean, not all of the healings were what I would call blockbuster healings. They never are that way. I mean, there's some that are, but others are of a lesser sort. They're important to the person who got healed, for sure, but, but they just don't have that wow factor. Um, but there were some really... I mean, truly amazing healings that happened in those classes while they were going on. And, you know, John taught that class for, I can't remember now, but I think it was five years. And, um, you know, there were just, there were amazing things. People with legs that were like this much too short, the leg would grow out and be healed. People who had cancer who got healed, blind people who got healed. I mean, there was no denying what was going on and it was creating this stir. And it was so much of a thing that I don't know where it is, but somewhere in my files someplace, I have a, an old magazine from Christian Life, and it had a light blue cover, and it was talking about signs and wonders in the seminary. And man, this just made them all kinds of cranky, so you know, in the, in the School of Theology and the School of uh, Psychology. And so it just had to go. It didn't fit a lot of people's cessationist theology that they held, and that, you know, they'd gotten it wherever they'd gotten it. Um, and in some ways, I think it, it was, I, I think in some ways all of this was serving to upstage maybe the preeminence of the theological faculty. And so with that, there was also a, I mean, I don't think anybody ever explicitly said this, but I, I, I mean, you could see what was happening. There was a sense of, we need to protect our turf. This is making us look bad. Right, right. 